You've heard my rant on proximate causes, shall we say? You know where what what's what's the, what is causing is almost too strong a word, but you know what what's going on here? Let me take it a step farther. Now the question, and then I'll pick up your phone calls. Now the question is, okay, that's what's so. Right? People, people who've been kept down for, for 400 years in this country were promised something in the 60s that they didn't quite get. They reacted in the late 60s, early 70s. There was an implicit and fairly explicit promise, actually, in the election of an African-American president and, and, and uh, you know, other changes, excuse me, cultural changes and things across the country that implied change, but the change is happening too slowly. So what do we do about this? And how do we, what do we do about it in a way that's not just, hey, maybe we can reach into the hearts of white people and make them less crazy, right? And that's not what I'm talking, that's not going to happen. I mean, maybe here and there, but systemically, again, we're talking about a system and it's an economic monster. It is an economic system that is wrapped up in a political system. And here's what uh, John Angelos, I, I think I read this yesterday, but it's, I want to put this in this context. The, the chief operating officer, essentially the vice president of the Baltimore Orioles, said about, the, about what's going on, what was going on in, in uh, Baltimore. He said, my greater source of personal concern, outrage, and sympathy beyond this particular case, and I don't know the race of John Angelos, although I believe he's a white guy, but in any case, he said, my particular source of personal concern, outrage, and sympathy beyond this particular case is focused neither upon one night's property damage nor upon the acts, but is fo- focused rather upon the four, past four-decade period. He's talking about, obviously, the, this era of free trade and Reaganism. The past four-decade period during which an American political elite have shipped middle-class jobs and working-class jobs away from Baltimore and cities and towns around the U.S., to third-world dictatorships like China and others, plunging tens of millions of good, hard-working Americans into economic devastation. And then, this is the, the number two guy in the Baltimore Orioles. And then followed that action around the nation by diminishing every American's civil rights protections in order to control an unfairly impoverished population living under an ever-declining standard of living and suffering at the butt end of an ever more militarized and aggressive surveillance state. He said the innocent working families of all backgrounds whose lives and dreams have been cut short by excessive violence, surveillance, and other abuses of the Bill of Rights by government pay the true price, the ultimate price, the one that far exceeds the importance of any kid's game played tonight or ever at Camden Yards. There's a far bigger picture for poor Americans in Baltimore and everywhere who don't have jobs and are losing economic, civil, and legal rights. And this makes inconvenience at a ball game irrelevant in light of the needless suffering government is inflicting upon ordinary Americans. So how is government inflicting that needless suffering on ordinary Americans? I would submit to you that it is happening as a consequence of our economic policies. You've got, you know, Reaganism. We need to, we need to basically roll back Reaganism. We need to go, Baltimore used to be a thriving town. We used to make things in Baltimore. Take the train from New York to, from, from uh, DC to Boston sometime or DC to New York. And just look out the window as you're going through Baltimore in the suburbs. Miles of empty factories that 30 years ago were not empty. They were running full steam, full tilt boogie. They were making everything from, from watches to socks. They were making blue jeans and they were making car parts. They were making radios. They were making televisions. They were making, you name it, anything you could walk into a store, including a Walmart, before Reagan became president, was made in the United States. We made stuff here. And in the process of making that stuff, we built a great middle class. And it was a multiracial middle class. Yes, there was still a lot of racism. And for many, many years, a lot of unions worked pretty aggressively to keep the unions all white. That was all changing. Slowly, but changing in the 60s and 70s and early 80s. 
And then Reaganism came along and, and this religion of free trade. And the tariffs that we had had in place from the George Washington administration to the Ronald Reagan administration of an average 30% import tax on goods, which, by the way, is about what the import tax, the effective import tax is, is the result of reversing out of that tax, is for any, you know, you want to import something into Taiwan, into, into Japan, into China, into Germany, into France, you want to import something, you're going to pay a tax. Which causes those countries to, to maintain their domestic manufacturing capacity because they're not. You, I mean, you walk into a store in China, it's not full of stuff made in America, it's full of stuff made in China. And that's just, that's not because the Chinese make better stuff, it's because of their trade policies. So, number one, we need to change our trade policies and bring back our jobs. As Bernie Sanders, who apparently is going to announce his, I have no inside information on this, but what I'm reading is he's going to announce tomorrow that he's running for president, which is way cool. But in any case, as Bernie Sanders keeps pointing out, we've lost 60,000 factories just since George W. Bush became president, and, and, and God only knows what the number was between Reagan and Bush. Probably at least another 50 or 60,000. Factories, not jobs, factories. We're talking about millions of jobs, tens of millions of jobs that we've lost because of insane trade policies. So number one, change our trade policies. And number two, you want to deal with poverty? You want to lift people out of poverty, regardless of their race? Two possible solutions. One is to do what Franklin Roosevelt did and say, you know, when democracy fails, excuse me, when capitalism fails, democracy has to step up. Government has to step into the void. So when there were no jobs for a third of the American public in 1933, what did FDR said? What did FDR do? He said, he said, you know, we've got this dust bowl going on in the central, in the, the Midwestern and central and southern United States, and it's the result of bad agricultural practices, and we need to plant trees. We're going to create the Civilian Conservation Corps, and we're going to put hundreds of thousands of people to work there. And then we've got to build dams and roads and the Hoover Dam and all this other kind of stuff, and we're going to create the World's Works Progress Administration. We're going to build buildings. We're going to build schools. We're going to build hospitals. We're going to put people to work. So either, number one, make the government the employer of last resort. And it's not like there's a shortage of stuff that needs to be done in this country. The, the American Society of Civil Engineers says we have a $3 trillion infrastructure deficit. And that's just cleaning up the old stuff that has been ignored since Reagan. You could throw another trillion dollars in there to build high-speed rail and fiber optic internet so that we could have a, 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 an infrastructure that could compete with China or Japan or Europe. I mean, the, the, uh, whose train was it that just hit 374 miles an hour? It was it, it, the world speed record. I think it was Japan. It might have been France. Um, but one of, one of these countries, I mean, 374 miles an hour on a train. Our fast trains in the United States, the Acela, go 75 miles an hour. It was Japan. Thank you, Shano. So either do that. Put people back to work. Make the government the employer of last resort. Where you're going to get the money to pay these people? Let's roll back the Reagan tax cuts. Corporations used to supply about a third of all the revenue into our country, into our government. Now it's about 11%. We can change that. And it's not going to put them out of business. It didn't put them out of business before. And rich people pay, you know. So you've got a few billion dollars less to put in your Swiss bank accounts. Let's put that money to work in the United States. Or the other alternative is a minim guaranteed minimum income, which Switzerland, excuse me, is going to be voting on this year. And this is where everybody in the country, we do this in Alaska, right? This is, I call this the Sarah Palin model. I mean, Sarah Palin jacked it up to the point where the year that she was running for vice president, her family, as I recall, took over 40000 got over $40,000 from the state of Alaska. Because in Alaska, they tax the oil companies for extracting oil and transporting oil. And then they put that money into this thing called the Alaska Permanent Fund. And they distribute that money every year as a check to every man, woman, and child in Alaska. So Sarah Palin comes from a family with, what, seven people in it? And every one of them got one-seventh of roughly 40, 40 grand. Now, you can live on 40 grand. You can also, you know, in other words, uh, the guaranteed minimum income is enough to provide a baseline for survival. And you can do away with virtually all your other welfare programs. 
if that guaranteed minimum income is reasonable, $25,000, dollars $35,000, something like that, not for every man, woman, and child, but for a head of household, let's say. So per household. Or you could make it, you know, five or $10,000 for every man, woman, and child, the way, that, you know, the, the way that they do in Alaska, only a little bit more generous. And now you are, if we did that, you would see an explosion of entrepreneurial activity in this country. People who are stuck in dead-end jobs who can say, yeah, screw this job. I don't want this job. I'm going to go out and start my own business. Or I'm going to go follow my path. I'm going to become a poet. We would have a new renaissance. I'm going to become an artist. I'm going to be a singer. I'm going to study the liberal arts. It actually improves society. And the young people who are in the Baltimore schools, particularly the young people of color in the Baltimore schools who are not graduating and not getting an education, why is that? I think it's because they know that there's nothing for them, by and large, even if they do graduate. So let's put something there for them. You're listening to Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. This is not rocket science. It, it, however, you're taking on a Republican, a very racist very corporatist Republican establishment.